So just a little bit about DriveNets for those who are new to us. Um, our vision is to build networks like cloud. And the idea of building networks like cloud is really to empower new possibilities. When you move to software, everything is possible. So the disaggregation of hardware, the software, the moving to a, a cloud-like model really unleash opportunities for our customers and even for us. Um, but it's all about our panel. So our speakers today are Igal Elbaz, who's the SVP of uh, and network CTO for AT&T. So uh, thank you for joining us, Igal. Um, then we have, uh, so we confuse you with the way they sit, but that's okay. And on my right here is uh, Jean-Louis Leroux, who's the interim executive VP for international networks at Orange. And Caetano Carbaccio, who's the VP of core, uh, Carba Carbaccio, yes. Yeah, no, uh, James will tell me to say it uh, more appropriately, but <laughs> I apologize. Uh, VP of core transport and service platform at Telefonica. And then uh, Ido Susanura, CEO. So um, everybody know the traditional network um, that um, the up up level, uh, the legacy, what we call network, that building and focusing from hardware-based solution. Um, you have three end customers, the consumer, enterprise, and broadband, and this is a traditional network as of today. We are here and we create DriveNet and fund DriveNet in order to do the transformation meaning to move those customers or those networks uh, to be cloud. What it's meaning cloud? It's meaning uh, shared infrastructure, open infrastructure, uh, running multiple workloads, and more important, once you certify the cloud, to add a new workload, it's just to add another software that leverage the resource that you have in the field. So instead that you want to add more capacity and you're running after line cards, or instead of uh, to certify another box or routers, physical routers from um, additional um, uh, vendors, uh, incumbent like uh, Cisco, Juniper, etc. everything running on the software. So this is what we are doing. So w this is what we believe. This is the involve of the network that we believe that will happen in the future and what we are doing with our customers. So we took the same concept that uh, the cloud did in the compute and storage, um, what we're familiar today with AWS and Azure, etc. cetera. Um, and we just replicated to networking. So if you're looking on the compute and storage industry, it starts from the mainframe, moving to x86, then the virtualization of VMware, and now everything is uh, cloud, as we're familiar, but nobody aware on the hardware where it's running, et cetera. We did exactly the same on the networking. Good afternoon, everyone. Igal El Baz with at and I just want to give a high view of our journey. So we've been in this disaggregation, virtualization, and software-defined networking journey for almost a decade. And we've been very public about this. We've been very, not about just the journey, but we put goals that we've uh, announced them in public. So we had to go and deliver them. We achieved uh, all of them in 2020, but it's a journey that we've continued. However, the number one challenge, which is a good problem to have, it's that the traffic coming from the left side is growing in about 30% year over year. So again, this is a good problem to have because that means that our customers are enjoying our services, are dependent on our services, and using more of our services. And over time, we had to develop an approach and an architecture that allows us to scale our network uh, much easier and, and than before. So a lot of this is running on concept of cloud, as Ido said, like how do you scale easily? How do you run software on top of hardware? And we're trying to apply those principles into every part of our network. I think the last thing that I want to say around cloud is we understand that today everyone on the left side are consuming more and more content and services from the cloud. So the architecture looks different today, whether it's consumer or enterprise. So being able to bring together users and branches into content that can be in different location and doing this in a seamless network experience, no matter what it's the transport, is something that we're building on top of this. Um, so with that, um, again, as Ido said, the, the part that DriveNet we're using is our core backbone. Um, 
we are carrying 590 petabyte of uh, ev every day. That's a lot of traffic. And on our core backbone, already over 50% of the traffic is running on an open disaggregated architecture where the network operating system uh, was DriveNet. And uh, we'll talk probably about this later, but we enjoy that relationship. We enjoy the disruption. We enjoy the ability to work together and push some boundaries in our ability to deliver not just software, but actually a full service that we can deploy at the reliability and the rigor that the telco at our scale need. So uh, yes, I'm managing, I'm part of Orange and managing the international uh, network, huh? uh, transmission, IP, uh, voice uh, roaming. T -t Today we are going to focus on uh, our uh, international and global uh, IP uh, MPLS backbone. Uh, we are running um, a backbone that is deployed in 100 countries and uh, roughly 250 points of presence. And we, pr we provide connectivity from a few meg to, to 400 uh, gig. We provide connectivity as a tier one uh, internet to, to wholesale customers. And we provide also connectivity to enterprise customers and VPN and cloud uh, connectivity. Uh, and the traffic, uh, I think we have the, the same trend. The traffic is uh, growing. It depends between 30% every year to 40% depending on the year. During the COVID crisis, we even had in 2020 uh, plus 60% um, of traffic uh, during, during the year. So this is, uh, this is what is at stake today. And our, our work uh, within it, Orange International Network is to uh, make sure we can absorb all this traffic increase while, of course, minimizing uh, our uh, cost, while ensuring the right uh, quality of service to our customers, and also, very important, while minimizing the carbon footprint. Hein? At the end of the day, in order to cover uh, the cost efficiency, the scalability, the green and the on-demand, we need elasticity. And I really like this, uh, uh, this is word elastic. We need elastic and flexible networks, clearly. And in order to answer to these requirements, the, 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 the solution is disaggregation, uh, as, you, as you clearly uh, demonstrated. Disaggregation, why? Because by separating the hardware and the software, uh, you, you can manage uh, your network uh, like a cloud, and you can scale uh, in an elastic and in a flexible way. This is why we decided one year ago to move uh, towards uh, disaggregation. So in a nutshell, uh, we start very uh, simply. We go, we go step by step. We have al already uh, disaggregated nodes up and running in the network, and we are very happy because we we, we, we did the math and uh, the, the TCO uh, improvement uh, is about 20% uh, uh, when we disaggregate. No, we are, we are studying uh, the core router and here clearly, uh, I would say that DriveNet, uh, uh, we have a very strong discussion, a very advanced discussion with DriveNet. DriveNet is clearly a, a very good candidate. I think the, the, the cloud uh, network architecture uh, uh, is really relevant uh, to, to, to provide this, uh, this elasticity. So we, we are going to uh, start doing some testing in our labs and uh, most probably we will have a trial uh, before, the end, uh, before the end of the year. Well, good, good afternoon. I'm Cayetano Carvajal, uh, leading core transport and service platform in the technical corporate unit of Telefonica, what we call Global CTIO. And uh, it is my, my pleasure to be here with you to comment about uh, disaggregation or softwareization or cloudification, you name it. Uh, in Telefonica network. So we are pushing for, for this aggregation in all the network layers. Uh, why? Uh, several reasons. First of all, when decoupling the, the software and the hardware, you uh, can have different innovation, innovation cycles and uh, software cycle could be faster and you can bring uh, new things to the network uh, in a faster way. You are eliminating one interior barrier for, for this innovation. Uh, this is uh, as well important for automation. Many of the automation uh, basic capabilities are coming with the software and we, need, we have a huge need of, of automating. Uh, this as well 
an ecosystem reason. So when reducing the entry barrier of the hardware, you can have more uh, vendors, more partners uh, for your network. So we are definitely pushing for disaggregation. As you can see, uh, we have been pushing for the disaggregation in all the network layers. In here, uh, we are about to do a, a, a swap remotely. So we are keeping the hardware uh, and we want to change the software provider of the of uh, something like 2,000 routers. What is bringing to reality one of the promises of, of disaggregation. You can change the, the, uh, the vendor remotely because of changing the, the software, uh, what will be an achievement, I would say. Uh, if, if I go higher in the hierarchy, uh, what we call HL4, with RASIS, we, have, we are running right now commercial processes and maybe we decided uh, to go for, for the disaggregated vendor for, for VRAS. And uh, of the top uh, for HL1, HL2, I mean Peering and Transit, is where we have been considering DriveNet. We have not done in operation yet, but we have been testing uh, DriveNet and uh, this is, uh, I mean, the result has been uh, good. Hi, uh, very impressive, by the way, to see where you were in the architecture roadmap. Uh, one thing I have, because uh, I remember working on some projects with AT&T and comparing it to Google's, um, and to manage a server was like $600 a year, uh, and it was six cents for Google. Um, so this direction that you're going with cloud makes a lot of sense, but have you looked at what the outcomes were for an economic point of view to say, here's what it costs me, whether it's cost per gigabit or whatever measures and says, here's what it's costing me now that I have 52% of the traffic there. Yes. <laughs> Is it close to the Google example in the past? We're getting really good TCO out of that journey. Everyone need to understand, we don't do anything just for the sake that we said that we've uh, first mover, or we work with disruptors, or we work with the startups, it, it doesn't matter. We're building an architecture that we believe serves us best in terms of scalability, cost, and we're trying to see who are the players that can fit in, and if they can fit in and we can deliver, then we're checking ourselves all the time to make sure that some of the assumptions that we had at the beginning make sense. Actually, I think in this case, are actually better. Um, Kelly Hill with RCR Wireless News. How does this change testing and monitoring for networks? Um, you know, is DriveNets responsible for you know implementing changes? Do you folks work together? Is this all in still in AT and T's wheelhouse? You know, how do you approach network testing and monitoring, and uh, in sort of making sure that everything works the way that you need it to work? Um, this is a great question. We do everything. We take the hardware, we take the software, we take the subcomponents, and we're doing all of the testing, we're running all of the regression, we're working with each one of the vendors to get their roadmap, and we're bringing this together, and we're checking all of the interfaces to other parts of the network because the core is to work with the edge, is to work with our systems. So AT&T is responsible end-to-end -end for every piece of hardware that gets, or software that gets into our network, and it's all done by us. C uh, clearly, that allows us to move a little bit faster because we have that level of disaggregation. Not all of the components are uh, moving at the same pace. And so, but still, we have um, getting software, from DriveNet and we're responsible for getting this into the network. I will add for that, that it's really dependent on the customer. So we have a US-based customer, like Egan mentioned, that really control the entire chain and probably getting the biggest value. And we have other customers either in Japan or India that want to the first phase to that we will be the um, one floor to chalk, meaning we're working with local integrator like, I don't know, CTC in Japan, so they're getting the hardware from the ODM, they're getting the software from us, we're doing the certification, we verified that the optics and everything is working, um, but and they deliver this to the customer, 
together with us, we're doing the certification with the customer. So it really depends. We have the two model. Um, tier one service provider typically taking control end to end from the um, service chain. Complementing a bit, uh, in Telefonica we have different set of operator and there are some that are more capable than others. Uh, when we introduce disaggregation, normally in any network ledger, we try to make it simple for our operational businesses. So we we define the role of an integrator and having uh, the, the responsibility of integrating the whole thing so they perceive the new solution as a new vendor like any other. Uh, when this is already introduced, then we split the responsibility and we take uh, in the operational businesses more and more responsibility for getting maximum value of the disaggregation. Because if not, uh, you will handle like any other uh, network element, it, it will not be useful. Huh? Let's come up regarding this question. So within Orange, uh, we plan to, to, uh, to, to operate ourselves with our teams, the network, but this disaggregation uh, is a great opportunity to drastically change the way we operate the network. You know, today we have teams, uh, the things, the bills, the run, it is well organized, well separated, etc. Uh, the idea with uh, this evolution toward the cloud-based networking, uh, we really uh, move to DevOps, DevNetOps, a real DevOps in the, in the core network. And, and this is a key enabler for this. I think what you're hearing is that there's two types of innovation. There's one area of innovation is develop a product. The other innovation is the tech insertion. How do you take new capabilities and insert them into the network at scale? By the way, that's much more complicated than develop a new product. <laughs> how you do this at scale, how do you do that tech insertion, how do you make sure that you bring new values in how you operate this, how you manage this, but that's, and you know, we take pride for being able to do this at scale in so many areas of our network over the last several years, but that's, there's, there's a lot into that. And you ask a good question about how we pay attention to this. Okay, I think we'll end with that unless there is anyone eager, okay? Uh, just to be uh, respectful of your time, thank you for uh, all of you who came. And